Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, welcome. Lots of announcements today. Lots of stuff. In the bulletin, there is a little insert. The National Day of Prayer is Thursday. They're having something at the um, uh, on Kings Highway at the Old Courthouse Green at 5.30 p.m. on Thursday. They're having a, a service. So if you want to go, uh, it's in your bulletin if you need that. Uh, this week we have on Wednesday, I need to add to the bulletin, the daytime uh, Bible study at 30. The evening Bible study is at 6, the choir is at 7. And it's a busy, busy month here. Spring has finally sprung for us here in Beulah. Uh, the 7th next week is the deacons meeting and the Hawaiian shirt day. And if you want, even though it's illegal in some states, Crocs with socks, I'm doing it. Just because you said I couldn't. <laughs> All right. So next week, next week, I will have my Crocs and my socks on. And I'm going to show everybody because I will do this. And um, my wife will give me that look like she just did. I knew it was there. And the, the 16th, we have a community meal. Um, ham, macaroni, and cheese. The ever popular green beans. Make sure you bring those. I almost bought peas, Hanover peas, just to screw with you a little bit, but I didn't. So bring those. Um, we're having roll, a cake. Um, don't listen to Kim on the directions for the cake just yet, because she's, you know. I heard about your cake. Two things. First of all, you failed to mention the Covenant Black Dogs next Sunday. Did you? Did you? Or did you I wasn't, I wasn't there yet. I was so I was so excited about my clothes I'm gonna wear. I have a week in advance. Okay, well. Okay, hot dogs yeah, next week. Yeah, I'll leave you to that. Bring them dessert. All right, we've decided that for the community dinner, we're going to and don't turn your nose up, Tony says, but we're gonna have a lemon sheet cake with chocolate frosting. It's really good. Mm. You need to reheat all this now. But we're gonna have okay. something for you, Lori. That's not chocolate. Uh, I can eat the sheet cake. But it's not <laughs> All right, so we're having lemon cheesecake. No, sheet, sheet cake. Sheet cake. Sheet cake, not cheesecake. Sheet cake. I don't Sheet cake. A sheet cake with chocolate icing. So next week we have hot dogs after service to share. And there's a sign-up sheet in the back if you guys are going to just sign up. All right, there's a sign-up sheet in the back for the community meal. There's also a sign-up sheet in the back for a women's tea. Um, the 21st, after service, we're having a woman's tea. So if you uh, want to sign up, the sign-up sheet is in the back. Also Where you bring a hat and your hat story. All right, so bring your hat, have a story to tell with your hat, whether it's historical or not. Um, speaking of that uh, business meeting in May, we ain't gonna have one. doesn't look like we're going to have one. Um, the, the second Mother's week Day. is Mother's Day. The third week is the, the tea. So if you have anything pressing, um, let one of the deacons know, and if we need to have a meeting, we'll slide one in somewhere. Um, if we don't, here's our couple-week notice that we're going to slide it back, uh, you know, if we, if we need to. So we have that also. Any other announcements that I missed? All right, if not, our first hymn is This Is The Day, 359, if you'll stand and sing, please.
Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning, Dave. I'm not wearing Crocs with or without <laughs> socks. So uh, <laughs> that's uh, not my style. Good morning. I'm glad each and every one of you are here in the house at Beulah here in uh, Lyles, Virginia. If you're out there on the web, we're glad you're with us. So glad that uh, you're with us, and we would like to hear from you occasionally, and I think the pastor does sometimes. But I'm glad you're here. Got a little story this morning. Uh, not about pastors. It's about monks. There was a monastery that the, the monks had, had taken a vow of silence. They were not allowed to speak ever, and that would be so hard for some of us here in this room, but <clears throat> once a year on Christmas Day, one monk was allowed to have one sentence. So on Christmas Day, this one monk, he got up and he said, I think the mashed potatoes that we have for lunch on Christmas Day are wonderful. Nobody said a word, went on the next year. Guy got up, another monk got up. He said, I think the mashed potatoes that we have on Christmas Day are too lumpy. So another year went by. <clears throat> Following year, the monk got up. He said, I am so tired of this constant bickering back and forth, he said. <laughs> They, they, they may have been monks, but they remind me of Baptists, right? <laughs> Glad you're here this morning. Let all those troubles you've had this week, all those worries, just put them aside now, and let's worship Jesus. Please bow with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the rain, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for each and every one that's here. Lord, be with those that, in our congregation that are sick and can't be here today. Uh, we just want you to be with them. Lord, we just ask you to be with our pastor today as he brings the message. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love and your grace, your forgiveness, and your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 And we're going to sing Heavenly Sunlight. Please stand.
Thank you, choir. Good morning, all. Good, Good morning. morning, Everett and Linda. Y'all aren't looking at me yet. They're going to move that camera over here in just a second. And uh, good morning, Terry and Kristen. Yes, David, I do get to speak to some of the folks who watch. I speak to Terry almost every day. Um, she is actually with Kristen in Bedford, Texas today. They, they've had a, a weekend of uh, uh, celebrating birthdays down there, and um, I'll go pick her up and uh, look forward to seeing you in just a little bit. Um, so glad y'all are with us. Um, Julie, it sure is. I praise God that you're back. I'm going to start with a praise and say good to see you here. And Linda said the same thing. Linda said she could hear you on the microphone whenever you were talking. And Linda said it was good to hear Julie back. And so, indeed, welcome back. Glad you feel like being here. Um, uh, and some of you know Bobby has been in the hospital and is back home as of the last I heard. He's still at home? Yes. Good. Um, went to see them this week. Um, what are your prayer requests at this time? Lori? Um, we prayed last week for Rachel's sister-in-law, Hannah, during her pregnancy. She's still struggling. Um, she's been in and out of the hospital this week um, for pre and quarantine. And for the baby, she had to go to the hospital for the baby Mom is not dealing well with stress. She's very, very emotional, and she's scared that she does. And she will have a C-section. She knows that, but she's scared. Her mind is letting her think about what if she's not here for this baby. Mm. Her, 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 two, her, her four-year-old mm. Hannah is in need. And what is Rachel's sister-in-law's yeah. name? Yeah. Hannah. You said that. I'm sorry. I just didn't get it written down. So Lori is asking us to pray once again for Hannah, who is Rachel's sister-in-law. Hannah is pregnant. She's having some blood pressure issues and uh, is stressed out over this complicated pregnancy. And so we want to pray for Hannah and for the baby, for all of that family. Um, again. Lori's on a roll. Bring it on. Bring it. So Lori is asking us to pray for her friend Patricia, the head custodian at the school. Uh, we've prayed for her for a few weeks. Uh, she had a car accident where her car was totaled. We prayed that she would find a car, and she has. Um, she still has some residual health issues uh, as a result of that car accident. We want to continue to lift her up in prayer that God will continue to heal her and restore her to her health. Number three. And this was a dedication of the Remembrance Garden? Uh, I guess you would say so, yes. We, find, we got it made, and this was when we, I guess, we dedicated it. 
Sure. So uh, for those of you who didn't hear all that, um, Lori is saying that her school has created a remembrance garden for Taylor Wood, the teacher who was killed last year. And um, the dedication, so to speak, uh, was yesterday. And uh, a lot of uh, the faculty were there, a lot of her classmates were there, a lot of her family were there. And so we just praise God for that. Other prayer requests or praises? David. The wreath of brother Daniel himself. That's right. Uh, Daniel Self, Doretha's brother, uh, fell and broke his hip. He was in the basement um, and was down there for just a little bit. He fell while he was down there, hit the concrete, and and uh, and broke his hip. I actually went to see him the day that I went to see Bobby at the hospital because um, I knew he was there, and they told me that his pastor was out of town um, for a few days. And so I went by and prayed with him before his surgery as well. Um, Mary, I saw your hand. Okay. And, and where does he live normally, Mary? Prison. I mean, does he, is he at home or he's going to leave this facility and go to another facility? You said he's going to leave in a couple of weeks, I thought you said. Yeah, he's, he's in an uh, assisted living, so they figure out what that means. Okay. So Mary has a prayer and a praise for her brother Leonard, who, whose health has been on the decline. He's doing a little bit better today um, in a facility. Um, trying to, de to determine what the best uh, placement option is for him. So we want to continue to pray for Leonard, pray for that family, and celebrate that he's doing just a little bit better. Absolutely. Other requests? Any other praises? Mary's saying she wants to praise God for all the good stuff. And if we'll just open our eyes and look around us, we'll see God's blessings everywhere. And I think that's true. Tim. We've got people back. We have people back. Anybody in particular you're thankful who's here? Everyone. Everyone. Yes. <laughs> that's a trick question. Just making sure everybody's paying attention. Yes, we're glad all of you who are, uh, have been away for any length of time, glad you're back with us. Let's pray together. Loving God, thank you for this day. Thank you for loving us and calling us to love our brothers and sisters around us. God, we pray that this time that you would be with Hannah. You would continue to be with her um, with what we call um, a complicated pregnancy. God, we pray that you would ease her spirit, that you would calm her, that you would put people in her presence who have the skill and the, the message of, of where her real peace can come from. We pray for her baby. Pray that you would protect that child and that you would uh, restore the health of the child as well. God, be with all of those who love Hannah this day. God, we thank you for Patricia, for her work in the school, for her friendship with Lori and so many people in the school. We thank you and we praise you for making provision for her, for transportation. And we ask that you would continue to restore her to health following her car accident. God, we ask you to be with Daniel Self. 
pray that you would restore him to health, that you would heal him through medical means and miraculous means, help him to uh, rehab his hip and get back on his feet and back to his normal daily life. God, we pray that you would be with Leonard, Mary's brother. We thank you for him. We thank you that there are medical interventions that can help him. We pray that you would sustain him, that he would know your peace, that he would know your love, that he would know your care from all of those who work and tend to him. God, we thank you and praise you for all the good stuff the blessings we see around us for the blessings we don't even recognize yet. Open our eyes that we may see. But we certainly can see that Julie's with us and we're thankful to you for restoring her health, for helping her, for giving her the initiative to work as hard as she's had to work to get back on her feet. We praise you that, that Bobby and Doretha are back home. Pray that you would continue to minister your healing to him and to her and to them. And God, we are, are uh, thankful to you whenever we can um, remember Taylor. Thank you for all of the initiative and effort that was put forth to create a remembrance garden, a place where people can sit and pray and meditate and think about their friend, their teacher, their colleague, seeing the nature that they've cultivated that you yet have provided. God, speak to us this day. Help us to see where we have fallen short. Help us to recognize where we could do those things you wanted us to do that we have yet failed to do. We pray that you would forgive us for those things that we've done that you would rather we not have done. So that we may ultimately glorify you. Hear these and all of our unspoken prayers. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Our offertory hymn is He Keeps Me Singing. Won't you stand with me and let's sing together.
Our text for the day comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter by the, sheep, the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. John says, Jesus used this figure of speech with them because they did not understand what he was saying. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have life abundantly. Amen. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. How are you doing this morning? Everybody, everybody comfortable? Mostly? You know it's my job to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, right? <laughs> right? Well, that may happen today. I, I don't know. Um, I, I just have this hunch. I was, uh, while many of you were in here in Sunday school, there were a couple of us who were having our own class back in the back. And I, I made a prediction, and I wanted to share it with you, and I'll let you decide whether it's prophecy or just an idle prediction. I predict that this church, that Beulah Baptist Church, is going to be called on to minister to people in ways that make us uncomfortable in the near future. I just have a hunch that the things that we are doing, the community meal mainly, but a bit, plenty of other things, the, the persons in this church, the individual ministries of each of us, whether lay or ordained, that, that we are going to encounter people that are going to, where God is going to call us to do things, to minister to people, to take care of people, to care for people in Jesus' name in ways that might make us uncomfortable. No, they're going to make us uncomfortable. I, I, that's my prediction. Um, here, I said it on whatever day today is, April the 30th, 2023. Mark my words, and let's see what happens. Today, I'm continuing with this, what has become a bit of a series. I didn't intend for it the first time I said updating our faith. But we are, at this point, in a several weeks-long process of using Jesus' life and teachings much of which we've all studied for our whole lives. We're using this to review our beliefs and practices to update our faith. And today, it's with a lesson about sheep. We want to listen for God's voice to see if we need to make adjustments in our beliefs and practices. Just like any growing human person, from infant to old age, constantly learns and adjusts to the world around them. We need to grow our faith, too, to make adjustments as we grow. In a bit, we're going to dig into that text I've read, but first, let me ask you, what if, what if you learned that everything you thought you believed about God was suspect or even wrong? And that's a heavy question. I'm not saying it is. I'm asking you a what if. I want you to try to put yourself in a mind space that lets you consider that possibility because we're going to read about that 
in our text. That's what, that's what happens in the text. So think about that for just a minute. If I stood here and told you that all of your beliefs were off target, if I just said that to you straight up, you'd probably call me a heretic. Be gone. I would be gone. If I told you the primary emphasis of your religious practice was somehow inconsistent with God's plan, you might not want me around much longer. At least one of you has already said so. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty, Robert. I count on it. Think for just a moment what that would be like to have someone whose reputation you might know um, to come in here and say, I'm glad you worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and even Jesus, but there's this major emphasis over here where you need to make major adjustments in your thinking, believing, and behaving. Have I got you yet? Can you imagine? Do you realize that this is precisely the threat that Jesus posed to the religious leaders he encountered from the text we've read? Either their emphasis on following the law was correct or virtually everything they believed was suspect at best or just absolutely wrong. What if you learned that everything you thought you believed about God was suspect or maybe even wrong? Let me see if I can illustrate. A fellow's driving the back roads when he comes across a ramshackle little home place and out by the mailbox there's a sign that says, Talking Dog for Sale. He decided that he needed to know more about this talking dog. So he pulls over. He cautiously approaches the front of the house, the front porch, and as he gets close, he hears this voice coming through the screen door. What do you want? I'd like to know more about the talking dog sign. There's a sign out there. I'd like to know more about your talking dog. Suit yourself. He's around back. The stranger, thankful he did not have to walk across the rickety porch, headed around the house. Now, this old house was sitting on a gentle hill that was sloping, so the front porch is almost at ground level, just a bare step up, but the back side of the house is several feet off the ground. Sure enough, there in the shade of the porch lay what looked like an ancient hound dog. Feeling silly, the man looked at the dog and said, You talk? And lifting a tired eye towards the stranger, Yep, said the hound to the man's utter amazement. <laughs> when the man could gather his wits, he continued, um, so uh, what's your story? Well, the hound dog, thinking he might as well get some amusement, answered him. Well, I discovered I could talk when I was just a pup. I decided I could help the government. So Charlie in there, he took me over to the CIA. In no time, they had me jetting from one country to another, sitting in room with spies and world leaders. No one figured a dog would be eavesdropping. When I reported what was said, I became one of the most valuable assets in the free world for eight years running. After a while, all the traveling started getting to me, so I decided to settle down. First, I did airport security. Why, I could mosey up to any unsavory character, hear everything. I uncovered so much criminal activity, I started receiving awards. Now, now, I'm just retired. Completely amazed at the hound dog story, the traveler goes to ask the owner, so what do you want for your talking dog? He said, $10. $10? That dog is amazing. Why would you sell him for, for just $10? Well, because he's a liar. He's never been out of this yard. <laughs> Sometimes I need to say something you might remember. And sometimes things are not as they appear. 
We need to be careful about what we believe. I know I don't need to say that to you, but I need to say that to you. Again, what if you learned that everything you thought you believed about God was suspect or even wrong? Let's look at our text a little closer uh, where we are going to find some Pharisees who are challenged with this very question in real time. When the text opens, Jesus is mid-message. If you are looking at a red letter edition, that's real obvious. You can see that he begins speaking in the middle or in John 9, and his lesson continues through at least the first half of chapter 10. What's going on here? Well, chapter 10 is a response to what, ha what occurs, what happens in chapter 9. And what is that? Well, Jesus encountered a blind man. Jesus healed the blind man, sending him to wash in the pool of Siloam. When the man's friends and neighbors saw that he had sight, they created such a commotion that the Pharisees decided they had to investigate. The investigation begins in chapter 9, verse 13. The Pharisees' investigation revealed that Jesus had allegedly healed the man on the Sabbath violating one of the most sacred beliefs and practices held by the Pharisees and other religious leaders. At first, they didn't even believe that the man had been born blind. They thought it was all a ruse until they called his parents to testify. After they heard from the man's parents independently, they had the man brought back to them for further questioning. Verses 35 through 41 of chapter 9, Jesus found the man after the questioning where, among other things, Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. Verse 40 of that ninth chapter, some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus responded, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. Don't miss this. The most fervent and certain persons, persons certain about their faith, said, surely we're not blind. It's their sin who remain, which, which remains, though. In our text for today, Jesus continues with what is a seemingly peculiarly placed parable. Verse 1, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and he, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, in our context, our American, our Western, our modern context, we think of ownership in a vastly different way than what existed in this ancient world. You see, in Jesus' story, the shepherds would not have owned the land on which their sheep were grazing. They didn't have a pasture that was fenced in. There was no fence. Neither would they have owned the sheepfold. The sheepfold would have been community property where multiple shepherds kept their sheep together for safety. Maybe they hired someone to be the gatekeeper or maybe they took turns being the gatekeeper. But neither the sheepfold nor the property on which the sheep grazed was their own. So the way to distinguish whose sheep were whose was by the voice of the shepherd. So the sheep that followed the particular shepherd, well, those sheep obviously belonged to that shepherd because they recognized the shepherd's voice. In Jesus' illustration, true shepherds had no reason to enter the sheepfold in any other way than the gate. The sheep would follow their own shepherd willingly. Thieves would have to enter, the outside, uh, enter outside of the watchful eye of the gatekeeper. And importantly, thieves would have to force the sheep to follow. As they tried to run away, they would have to drag them. Of course, all of these distinctions should have been obvious to all of Jesus' hearers, not just the shepherds in the crowd. 
as he explains in verse 4. When the shepherds has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Jesus explains just what I've explained. Verse 5, they will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of the strangers. Although the sheep herders would have understood Jesus' lesson about which sheep follow whom, John tells us that the Pharisees did not understand. Verse 6, Jesus used this figure of speech with them, John says, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Since they did not understand, Jesus elaborated by saying, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. He continues in verse 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came, though, that they may have life and have it abundantly. So what does Jesus say? Most importantly, when Jesus says in verse 8, all who came before me are thieves and bandits, Jesus right here at that point is challenging the Pharisees to update their beliefs and practices. They sought salvation by way of creating an endless array of, of rules amplifying the law of Moses. It was totally impossible to follow all of their legal requirements. They may have even stacked the deck for themselves, making it impossible for the masses to be righteous while letting others do their own dirty work. They still might claim a symbolic righteousness because I don't have to do all of those things that might make me unclean. Here, I'll pay somebody else to do it for me so I don't have to. In other words, they sought freedom by way of restriction salvation through bondage. Jesus offered a new way, an antithetical way in verse 9 when he said, I am the gate. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. As much as anything, Jesus offered a freeing new paradigm that is not reliant upon meeting an impossible legal standard. Thanks be to God. Jesus offered freedom through faith in him. And the Pharisees could not bear the thought of their system having any flaws. In fact, the Pharisees' arrogance about their beliefs is hard to miss. Look back at chapter 9, verse 34, if you have your Bible open. They answered him, the man formerly blind, you were born entirely in sins and you were trying to teach us. And so they just drove him out from them. Not only could they not stand Jesus, they could not bear to look on anyone who might remind them of Jesus' message or his miracle. So what do we do with this lesson? Well, personally, I aspire to the humility of the healed man. Chapter 9, verse 25. I do not know whether Jesus is a sinner. He's speaking to the Pharisees. One thing I do know, that though I was blind... Now I see. Amen. And I might add, through no effort or work on my own, Jesus did it all for me. Notice how his humility compares to the arrogance of the Pharisees. Again, chapter 9, verse 34. You're going to teach us? They see themselves as completely righteous. Of course, um, their righteousness is self-righteousness. They, they uh, attribute their own righteousness by themselves. It's not from God. Next, if anything keeps me up at night is this, that I would preach or teach or say anything that would be rooted in my own failed legalism instead of the freedom offered by Jesus. Related to that, I would hope that you would continue to join with me in this exercise of reviewing our faith for ways we might need to update our beliefs and practices. I pray that we have the eyes to see the ministry opportunities before us as they appear. I alluded to those that I anticipate them coming. The corollary of this prayer is that we would not be so invested in our personal biases like the Pharisees were 
that we miss seeing or understanding the corrections in our beliefs and practices God would want for us, for us to reach out to the community around us. Please pray with me. God, help us to see with your eyes. I say that boldly like that's possible. I say that boldly like I or we would know what to do if we did see with your eyes. Give us the strength and the courage of conviction to live the salvation that we all enjoy and share it with those around us. To, to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. God, speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time in our service each week, we sing a hymn of decision. Today that hymn is what a friend we have in Jesus. It's during this hymn, it's during this time that this church has set aside a moment for you to make public any kind of spiritual decision you're making about your walk with Christ. Whether that's a rededication, whether that's salvation, whether that's to affiliate with this church, whatever that decision is that you want to make, if you want to make it publicly, I hope you'll reach out to me or you'll come down and we can, I can pray with you here. Are you ready to sing? Please stand with me and let's sing together. What a friend we have. Please pray with me. Yes, we have found a friend in Jesus. And Lord, humbly come to you in this hour, bringing our lives to you, thanking you for the salvation we enjoy, and asking you to continue to inspire us to be the people you would have us to be. May we go from this place now as children of God, inviting others to become children of God, being the light of Christ in the world this day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen.